Sports, my professor Dejan, who is a poet, French, uh, French poet here of Spark Lecture Series. He is going to give us uh, give a preliminary course of six hours on three basic tools in our field. So, professor Dejan. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as you mentioned, the, we have a, we are on the, on the project uh, under the, the Spark uh, organization, and um, uh, so I am supposed I, I will give a, a course in that that on uh, local values, local uh, properties of arithmetical functions. And uh, since uh, well, I was planned at first uh, to come for seven or eight weeks continuously and of course all this has been changed and even in that and come uh, and so it's okay no so and uh, then I uh, so I decided to come here for you see I'm very happy to to be very much to be in Chennai it was a big frustration for more than two years not to come here yeah first time Balu, you remember first time we met, something is wrong. No? Yes. You tell me how it is. Otherwise, write everything on the board, but it will be a bit better. Better to be in good condition for. Her. Well, th what I'm saying here is, it is not. If it is not. Yeah. If it is not. Uh, Recorded, but I wanted to say the first time I, we met with uh, with Balu, it was in the mid 80s, and this was my first visit to uh, to Chennai and to AMSC here. Yeah, it's okay now. Good. Well, okay. So uh, since we, it's not done, in some in so, in a sense, what uh, what I have is the, the the plan for the for the course, the main course, which is uh, local values. Now you have to take the picture with the mask, possibly. I, uh, this was for the picture. So. What is the gangster? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it is uh, this property, and there will be the, the course, and I should come in uh, in September for delivering this uh, this course, maybe end of August uh, and September. And uh, there will be also, so it is useful to have some knowledge. I don't know exactly what, uh, what you know or not. Possibly you know ev everything I'm going to tell you. So I'm a bit, uh, it would be a bit frustrating for both of us to, <coughs> to follow this. But uh, this is something which will be the appendix for the, for the notes of the, of the course. So for the time being, it's not delivered as such because it, it, it is something that you find in a, all the, 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 the major books, but um, okay. So let me let me start now with the, with this business. Okay. So first part, I may call chapter one if you wish. Arithmetical function. So you tell me whether it is it is readable. It is too small. It is too. It's okay. If you are too far, you have still some room here. Okay, so first, some basic vocabulary. Some vocabulary, notation, and so on. Okay. So what is arithmetical functions? Well, an arithmetical function essentially is a sequence of complex number which has some interest for arithmetics. Of course, this is not a mathematical definition. So an arithmetical function is indeed an arithmetical function is a map simply from N to C. And are the integers in the, I don't know, AMS meaning that is to say one, two, three, and so on. Uh, that is to say the way in, uh, in the states you, you number the, 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 the levels. You see, first, first floor is ground floor. They don't know zero. Here you know what is zero, but I am surprised that this room is called one, two, three. It's nice because it is an arithmetic progression, but not zero to three. But 
Okay, so it's a map from n, so n starts at 1. It's a map from n to c, and uh, for example, uh, whatever you wish, the nth prime number or anything like that, this would be a, this would be a sequence of interest. By the way, uh, I use also the word sequence. So sequence is a bit complicated because it has two meanings in, uh, in mathematics, especially in number theory. Sequence is, first, it is something which is a map from M, from N, to whatever you wish. Let us call it E, the, the set, but to any set. This is a sequence of, uh, of number of elements of E. This is just, it's a map. But it has also, for us, another me meaning. It is a subset of N. We say the sequence of prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. You, you possibly know the other ones. Uh, well, those two meaning exceptions are connected to something which is called indicator function. So it's also something interesting. So indicator function of a set, let uh, S, I don't know, be a subset of N. So that is to say sequence in the second exception, you can associate to it we associate to S its indicator function. I prefer the word uh, indicator function than characteristic function because in probability, characteristic function is a Fourier transform in the, this. This is also something we use. So uh, it's done like that. One S, usually we, we denote it like that. Ah, yes, some notation. Uh, if, I, if you see something like that, it means the number one. I try not to write it that way, but it is more or less the way in handwriting in French, you, you would write one like that, so it's a bit complicated. But if you see something curious. So this is one S, one S of an integer N is equal to zero if N does not belong to S and one if N belongs to S. Okay, this is the indicator function of a set. And uh, this is in some way one-to-one -one because to a subset, you associate an indicator function. So this indicator function is a sequence of elements in zero, one. But once you have a sequence of elements in zero, one, you can associate, of course, a subset, a subsequence, a sequence of, of integers, which is the sequence of those elements n for which the indicator function takes the value one. So in some way, this connects those two meanings those two exceptions. Okay, oops. Now some notation also, uh, it's interesting to have, if you consider um, uh, real numbers, the integers which are in some interval, so you may say what are the, in the, number, the integers which are inside A, B or something like that. So we denote the following. Uh, if you take, for example, a, B like that, this is A, B. That is to say, this is the closed interval of real numbers between A and B, and this is the one which are integers, okay? Of course, I am not going to write everything you can imagine, but if you put a double bracket, it will correspond to a simple bracket here and so on, okay? So this is quite convenient. In some cases, we need to do that. Now, if you have a real number S, x to u, even, to u belongings to r, we associate the fractional part of u. So u is something which is the maximum of the t in z, such that 
uh, t is at most u. Okay, so you you see, for example, that the fractional part of pi is three. The integral part of pi is three. The integral part of minus pi is minus four. Just be careful with that. With the minus sign, you have something. Uh, the integral part of minus u is not minus the, 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 the part of u. It's not too close, but it's something like that. The fractional part of u is, uh, again, u minus its integral part. Fractional part of pi is 0 0.14159265 and so on. OK? And uh, what is then? So this is integral part. I don't write it because I'm not going to write everything. But this is called the integral part. This is called the fractional part. There's also something which is interested, interesting, which is this, which is uh, you can define as being the minimum of uh, uh, u and 1 minus u. And it is also the minimum of uh, u minus t when t belongs to z. OK? Oops. And for this reason, this is, this is called, it doesn't mean much, but uh, the distance of u to the nearest integer, except that the nearest integer does not exist. If the fractional part of u is equal to 1 half, we have exactly two integers for which it is closed, but the distance to both of them is 1 half, so it's not too complicated. So I used to, to say that the distance to the nearest integer. So uh, in, among the notation, I try to keep the, the letter P for prime numbers. I'm not going to, to study LP space. Then definitely you have to use P in a, in a different uh, sense. And also you, we write D divides N. So this is D, D divides N. And uh, you write also for a prime P, you say that P alpha divides N, strictly N, when it divides N, but when p to the alpha plus 1 does not divide n. OK, I think all that is well understood. So just to, to conclude this uh, useful, useful tool, it is called partial summation. Partial summation, let me write it as a lemma. Uh, you have the following, let a n. Usually, uh, all the sequence, if I, except if I say something different, and then I will po point it out. But if I say I have a sequence n, it always means that I start with 1. OK? Uh, sequence a n of complex number, a sequence of complex number. complex number, uh, and it's e of t. It is this counting function. The counting function is the, no, the, it's not the counting function. It would be, yeah, uh, forget about what I say. It's just the sum n of 2t uh, of a n for t positive, OK? Then for any function. Nice function, B, which is continuously differentiable in 1x. We have, one has, as you prefer, the following, that summation of a n, n less than x. Again, if I say n x than x, it means that I start as 1, if I don't make anything precise, of B n. B of n is this function. You can write it in the following way. It is ax bx, this is a very useful lemma, minus integral from 1 to x of a of t b prime of t dt. OK, so of course, wh wh once you know that this exists, then to prove it, you can do it with bare hands, whatever you wish. It's easy. You just cut on intervals which are from n from 1 to 2 for 2 to 3 and up to 
uh, integral part of x and then the, the little thing that remains and, uh, and you make all, all the things and you can check that this is true. I mean, this is not too difficult. But we call that really partial summation because if you have some notion of, a, of derivative or integration, which goes a bit above Riemann integration, uh, for example, uh, Stilges integration, then this is really a, a Stilges integration. You see, what you, what you can say is the following that this, if you look at the derivative of such a function, of course, such a function is a step function. But its derivative, then you see it as, de de as derivative as a measure, or if you know about distribution, then you can see it as distribution. Essentially, its derivative will be a Dirac at each point of distribution with the weight, which is exactly the difference between the left limit, the right limit, and the left limit. Okay? So, and then what you, are, what you are writing in this context, you would write to say, so let us say this is the proof, it will be sum 1 minus 2x of b of t to be sure that we, that we take the weight at 1. This is what it means, this. <coughs> of d of a of t, this is exactly this sum. Essentially, what we are going to count is you are going to count b of n, with the weight an exactly at each point of n. So this is the meaning of the derivative of the uh, Stilges integration, if you wish, with respect to the function, the step function a, or, uh, or the, in, the, in the sense of distribution. And then you would say, of course, we integrate as we usually do. That is to say, we take the integration of that, well, this will be ax. And then uh, we take also this one, this is the terms which is integrated at x and at 1 minus it will be 0 because a of a minus is 0. There is nobody in this sum. And uh, then it is minus integration from 1 minus to x. And then what you do is you integrate this one and you differentiate this one. So if you integrate this one, you get a of t. And if you differentiate this, then you get b prime of t dt. OK? So this is just really integration by part. OK, it's very useful. Um, OK, example, I leave it to you, but uh, we'll quote that in a, in a few minutes. Example, if a of t is uh, equivalent to uh, t, as t tends to infinity, and b of t is equal to 1 over log t. Be careful with the 1, you may have difficulty, but since I am just looking at something which is asymptotic, at the value 1, you can, you can move your function b and take whatever you wish, it will give you a finite term and you don't care much about that. Then you will get something which tell you that the sum then better to start at 2x of uh, an over log n will be equivalent to x over log x. Okay, so this is something which is very useful. All the, all the time you have something like that, you know something about the sum and you slightly modify it and you get something which is fine. And you don't have a question of positivity of, uh, or anything like that. Okay? Good. The, the, your terms may be complex numbers. So if you are modifying, you see a, a trigonometric sums or something like that with smooth weights, then you can use also this. Quite interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. The, In Germany, they know how to clean the boards. It's wonderful. They, they have just a, a sponge, wet sponge. They do that. And then they have something, you see, to take the water out. Like, uh, like you have on the screen of your car, you see, to clean that. It's wonderful. It's dry immediately. And
Okay, maybe I leave. I should have left even this. Okay. Ah, we are entering the real subject. Euler's proof of the infinity of prime numbers. Primes, let us say. Okay, you know the, the, the classical proof from the, the Greek uh, of infinity, uh, that there are infinitely many prime. You take the product of all the prime you know. By the way, it's not, they, they would not never have said that the number of prime, the primes are infinite or something like that. It was never phrased like that. They don't know that it was something they, they couldn't imagine that something infinite could exist. Uh, the, the point was the following to say, give me any family of prime, I show you that there is another one. All that's there into finite statement. Okay, so uh, give me uh, your family of all the, what you think to be all the primes. You make the product, you add one, and then you factorize this number, and of course it has prime factors, and those prime factors are different from the one you, you had before. Okay, so, uh, but this doesn't give you that there are that many primes. If you look with this demonstration, how many primes you have up to x, it tells you that up to x you have something like log log x, prime factors. And if you look at tables, you have the impression that there are much more than that. Okay, so uh, the proof of Euler is the following. So you consider a real number, S, larger than 1. And then you write this series. We say a word about series later, but uh, especially this one. Before the time being, this is fine because this is convergent, as you know. Uh, you compare with an integral, and uh, this is fine. So this is convergent. And now you can write this curious thing, which is the product of all the primes of 1 plus 1 over p to the s plus blah 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 plus 1 over p to the alpha s plus blah blah blah. You take all the powers of the primes like that. So first of all, there is no problem about convergence if you think a bit of what it is. Because this series is very well, it is geometric series. So this is very well convergent. It is something, by the way, this product, we will write it later on as the product of 1 minus 1 over p to the s minus 1. Okay, if, you, if you expand 1 over 1 minus x, you say you get 1 plus x plus x squared plus, uh, plus and so on. So it is exactly this. So you can write it that way if you wish at the beginning. But if you write it this way, it's quite interesting because when you try to see what are the elements you get like that, well, essentially, each time you take a set of powers of primes, then you will have the product which is a certain integer, and you get it here. And since you have the unique factorization, then every integer will be obtained in this product only once, and all will be obtained. So in some way, this is a way, an analytic way to say that you have the prime factorization. Okay. Fine. Now what, uh, by the way, I said that, and I think it's fine to, to write it here you know, like that. But if you want to prove this inequality, this equality, it's better to understand that it is here, and you truncate, and uh, and you know that everything is absolutely convergent, and so it's not analysis is not difficult. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now what Euler is doing is the following, which is very clever. He says, what happens when s is going to one? So this function is a decreasing function. So if you if you take it reverse word, it will, it will be uh, increasing in minus s, if you wish. So if s is tending to 1, then this will be increasing. This will be increasing also. You see it from here very, very easily. Everybody will be increasing. In any case, they are equal. They cannot do something else than that. But uh, what is interesting is that this one will tend to infinity. <coughs> because if it were going to a finite limit, it would mean that the harmonic series converges. 
This is easy to see that it doesn't converge. You take it by block between n, between n and 2n, and, uh, and then you, you see that uh, the harmonic series diverges. So now, when s tends to 1, this tends to infinity. Good. Now, assume that you have only finitely many prime. If s tends to 1, then this goes to a finite limit. So this doesn't work, and so there should be should have brought some water. But uh, so this tends to um, this tends to uh, a finite number, except if there are, if you have infinity. If yeah, now now the point is that you see I'm not as clever as you are. It is it is my bottle from now on. Thank you very much because see yeah. Each time I say. I will, when I am home, I practice under my shower to learn how to, to drink out of a bottle. But uh, okay, thank you in any case. Now it's mine. <laughs> okay, but it, it tells you much more than that. Because it tells you the following that if you, morally, if you are th thinking of S is equal to 1, you have to see well, what happens when S tends to 1, blah, blah, blah. But what you are saying, is that the sum, if you take the log, if something is tending to infinity, its log is also tending to infinity. So it tells you that minus the log, I mean, our reasoning blah, 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 implies that the log of 1 minus 1 over p to the s diverges. Then over p. By the way, this is equivalent to the sum. This is equivalent to the sum of one over p. You see, you make the the expansion of the log. Then what you will get is the first term it will be a minus one over p with a minus this is one over p, and then you have something which is one over p square, and then this is p naught because this is the sum. The sum of the inverse of the square is converging, and you are happy with that. So this is divergent. So it means that you have really many, many primes. You have more primes than squares, for example. Okay? And uh, this is much better than the, than the first uh, proof. So, okay, so this is nice. And uh, do, 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 do. So, okay, I'll go, I'll go to that uh, uh, later on. <clears throat> of course, we will go, we'll go further from that. You can get something. You understand that if you are truncating, you have something which will be something like, like a log x if you, if you stop at x. And uh, it will mean that uh, this sum will be something like log x, the truncated harmonic series. And uh, you are taking the log. And so possibly if you are taking primes up to x, you have something which will be log log x. No, but we will talk about that later. Now I go to formal Dirichlet series. Yeah, I have first a question for you. What is a series of number? You let me speak about series and you you don't uh, you don't say we don't know what is a series of number what is, what is, what is it, what is it for you so what is the harmonic series it's a monoid hmm you have a series with terms around a monoid you have a series with terms around a monoid or something yes yeah. So what you what you want to do, the, the point is that you see a series, well the series, if you say the harmonic series, it is the sequence one over n. So the question is to know what you do with the sequence. Now there are two answers with this. Let us think of the usual series. Usual series, 
uh, you have two things. You, so first of all, you have a sequence an. This is a sequence an. Okay. And when I am thinking of series, I'm thinking of something a bit different. So I know what is, I, I, as an analyst, I will say, okay, I know what is a series that, a sequence that converges. Then if I, I'm looking now at a series an, what I will be thinking of is that, ah, oh, what is the sequence which is of interest for me is the sequence n, uh, k less than n of a k. And this is a sequence in k. And now I'm looking at the convergence of this sequence. So it's not exactly the same thing. So this is the analytic point of view. But you were mentioning also the fact that you can do it algebraically. So algebraically, well, for a sequence, essentially, you make it a ring with two laws. The laws is the same a plus b. So the a n plus b n will be the sequence a n plus b n. You may also consider if you make the product of two series, the two sequences, it would be a n times b n will be a n times b n. Component by component. And this gives you a very nice ring. Now, if you are looking at the usual series, well, the sum will be the same. The sum of the two series you take term by term. So we will have the sum a, a, n, a plus a n plus b n. This will be the sequence of a series with general term a n plus b n. But you know that if you are looking at the product, you will introduce a law which is completely different from this one. And the law which, uh, which you introduce is the law which will be e n times b n, I don't know, times b n. This is the Cauchy product. And it will work and it will make things uh, quite, uh, quite nice. And if ev this, everything converges, at least converges well, it turns out that the, if you look at this series, it will converge to the product. Be careful, convergence of each of them is not enough to ensure that the product converges. If you have absolute convergence, you are happy. But, uh, and so this is just the sum when um, uh, m plus n, m, l, k, plus, k plus l is equal to n of a k b n minus k or a b l if you prefer okay is there. okay so this is the cauchy product okay now what we are interested in when i say formal dirichlet series i'm going to do exactly the same thing that here to introduce it in some way abstractly and abstractly for dirichlet series Formal means that I don't care about the, the convergence. Here you can say the same thing for any sequence. If you look at all the sequence, you can look at the series with these laws and it gives you a ring of the, of the series. Then the convergence is something different. It is the analytic uh, question. Formal Dirichlet series. I can tell you what it is. Well, essentially what you have is that I am not going to, to, to introduce a special uh, special word there, maybe t D of A. Oh, okay, forget. Formal Dirichlet series, if you have a sequence, let me write it that way if you wish. A n, I'm not going to keep this notation, it's just that I don't want to have the, the notation I have here. Of course, when we are used to that, I say, I take this formal Dirichlet series, I associate it to, to this. So this Dirichlet series, plus bn is uh, an plus bn. So this defines you a low plus. And the m multiplication, it's a sort of, this is a convolution, you see. This is a convolution that is to say you can write it when k is between 0 and l. This is another way to, to hit it, uh, between 0 and l of a k b n minus k. Okay. And uh, then here we have the, the product. I know you write it the way you wish. After a while you just say it is the product and that's it. So it will be a convolution, but it's not an additive convolution. It is a multiplicative convolution. 
multiplicative convolution means that this will be the sequence where the nth point will be a summation when m when kl let us say the product kl is equal to n of a k b l okay this is the nth term it don't do it right here so now this you know goes well with the usual way to consider it it goes well also if, by the way if you are looking at power series if you are thinking of power series, you can see it also as a formal power series. It will go also that if you are looking at the sequence sum of a n x n, then it will behave in a nice way. And this one behaves well exactly for this type of series. You have a constant function which is 1 and you look at 1 over n to the s. So what we associate to that, in some cases it works and we are happy, we associate the sum of a n over n to the s. Okay? Now this is a Dirichlet series and this was introduced by, by Dirichlet, but definitely the first one who used that and make a nice use of it is Euler. It's really the, foundation of a Dirichlet series. And the product is well done in the way that if everything converges, if S for some S, if this converges, then you, will, you would expect that you have at least converges in a good sense, converges absolutely, something like that. Then you would have, of course, that the summation n is 1 to of a n n to the S times the summation then better not to use the same index. If you, if you use in the same formula, two sums, it makes uh, artificially it makes sense, but uh, you, will, you may get into problem. Okay? So if you made this product, and you assume that everything is fine, that uh, you, can, you can work quietly, then you see that when you are making this product, what you will say is that this is the sum over n and m, 1 to infinity, of a n to n to the s, bm to m to the s. And so if you group the things by the same denominator, let us say k, which has a different meaning than there, but it's not a problem, of 1 over k to the s, then what is the coefficient you have for 1 over k to the s? Then you have to have that the mn, the product mn is equal to k. And so this will be the sum when mn is equal to k of a n b m. Okay? So it, it plays the same role, this uh, Dirichlet uh, series, for formal expansion as a Dirichlet series than this one for the polynomial. Okay? And it's nice because you have the arithmetic properties. It's, this is why you have this wonderful thing here. Well, what was really interesting is that you can, when you make the product of two elements, you just get the, the product a to the s, b to the s is a, b to the s. Okay? okay? So now you may have also the question to know when it converges and things like that. But, uh, essentially, this is what we are interested in, is really to see what is the formal point of view. Formal Dirichlet series, you don't have to ask whether it converges or not, exactly like you do for formal power series. Okay? So, fine. Well, <coughs> by the way, then you have to, to prove, and it's not, it's not completely trivial if you want to prove that this gives you a structure of a ring. You have to check that uh, you have the distributivity, you have associativity, you have uh, all, the, all the things like that, you see, all the laws that are good, that you have a neutral element is not too difficult, that you have an inverse. You have also to work a bit on that, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll say a few words about it, but we are not going to, 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 to see that. But the fact that this product corresponds really to a real product here makes it clear that it should, it should work in some way. It is. Okay. So... 
So now when you have some expression like that, whether it converges or not, this we write, if you have, so we write, let us say, V of AS where A is a sequence, is a uh, sequence of number, is a, yes, when A, A is a sequence of complex number, and S, by the way, a real number, but you, you can use also a complex number. 1 over n to the s. n to the s, you see n is always larger than 1. So for any complex number, n to the s is well defined. It is exponential of x log n. There is no problem in defining the log of a positive number. So this is well defined. And so this makes a series in the usual sense of complex numbers. Okay. And there is no reason. Of course, in the proof, in the proof of Euler, you just consider re real numbers and larger than 1, then you have something which is really uh, convergent and you are happy with that, but you can define it for what we think to be if you want to remember that. That is to say that you have the law, this is really the formal power series. But it's not that, but you, then you say we have the, the rules which are D of A and s, let us say d of a and s, plus d of b and s, the same s. Then this is d of a plus b s, and d of a s times d of b s. This is d of a Convolution, maybe convolution is written with a star, B, S. Hmm? This product is called the Dirichlet convolution. It is a multiplicative convolution, the one we introduced already, hmm? which is there. So I put it like that. Indeed, the usual notation here, usual notation is a star. Okay, fine. Okay, we know that everything works well with these laws, everything is fine. And um, now you have to find a few, a few things. Of course, the zero is the additive one. Zero, which is the sequence zero, 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 and so on. Is the neutral for the sum, okay? And uh, the neutral for the multiplication, we call it delta. It may, it may vary according to, to different people. It may be different, different notation. It depends if you, are, if you really need delta for some other use, then you don't call that delta. So it's not, a, but usually we'll use delta for this, for this uh, meaning except. So delta is just one, zero, zero, zero. It is the, oops, it is the, how you call that, the indicator function of the point one. Okay? You check how it is that it is really the, the product. So you have something, what will be the, what will be this series if you have the delta m which is one and otherwise zero, it's just the, the value will be one when it converges. And if you do it formally, it will work also very well. Okay. So then you have something which, which will be, so if you take zero plus A, D of zero S plus D of A S, this is D of A S, something which is also interesting, D of delta, S times 
times. No, times is just the usual times. D of um, AS, this is D of AS. OK. So this is it. OK. Uh, one is also something of interest. One is in some way, to, you may say, oh, it is the indicator as function of someone. Yes, it is the indicator function of all the integers. So this corresponds to the sequence one, 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 and so on. So if you take this function, then you have the Dirichlet. Ah, maybe, no, no, I, may, I made something stupid. I get, I, I told you something stupid. Now I am confusing two things, and this is a big mistake, because delta, yeah, it's fine. No, it's okay, yeah. Um, uh, sorry? I would rather call delta the, 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 the Dirichlet series associated to 1000. So this is not, my notation is not good. What I want, what I want to do is the following. It's not that. OK, I'm not going to give a name for that. This has a meaning, if I have a sequence. And this I will denote by delta. This is the formal power series, sorry. The same way, 1. the formal power series associated to this number. Which is the zeta function, if you wish. OK? We also write, if you are taking it as a formal power series, it is 1. That is to say, in the ring of formal power series, if you like to see what is the value of d of 1, 1, 1, and so on, s, when it converges is denoted by zeta of s. That is to say, when s is uh, as a real part, which is other than 1. If you want to expand, then, the complex function zeta, it's still called, of course, zeta, but it has nothing to do any longer with the formal power series. There are two things which are quite different. OK, so uh, I see that I have to correct my notes. I don't like what I've written. It's not good. Now, the point is to know whether you can invert this formal Dirichlet series. Can you invert it? Well, you know that this one, what we wrote before, is that one can be written I don't go into all that because then you would you would have to say also what is a formal power series, a formal power product, a formal Dirichlet product. Okay, just I think if you understand what is formal Dirichlet series and 
that it, it is not a question of the value and of convergence and things like that, but it is really abstract game you have, then it's fine. This is the point. And you can do the same thing for the product. So you can write formally without knowing whether it converges or not, the sum of the one over S for any value of S, but this is formal. It has nothing to do any longer with the value when it converges. Okay, one can be written as a formal Dirichlet product. And of course, this Dirichlet product will be something like the product of a P of one minus one over P to the S minus one. So if you want to have an inverse for the, for the conver convolution, you know that the inverse for the convolution should give you the inverse for the value when the value exists in some way. So one minus one will be the following corresponds should correspond or corresponds to the formal Dirichlet product the p of 1 minus 1 over p to the s. When it has some sense, it has to be the inverse. So formally you say this will be the inverse. And of course it will work when you, when you do that. Now you can see what is this function. So the inverse of 1 is associated to the sequence which we usually call mu of s, mu of n. And you get the value from that when you expand it. So in some way, this is not, I mean, this is not correct to write something like that in the, in the formal sense. But you have that behind your mind and then you say, well, I will follow then the formal rules and everything will work because it has to be consistent with this. Exactly like we, you, you do with a formal power series. With formal power series, you don't know whether it converges or not, but you say, okay, it is a good formalism and it should do, do, and you make the computation how you are used to. You don't care to know whether it is legal or not in some way from an analytic point of view. Okay, so defined by Well, when you are going to make this product, p to the s, well, when you are going to find something which is non-negative, only if the number you have has only prime factor to power one. If it has a prime factor to a higher power, boom, you will never see it in this product. You can see only element n to the s when n is a product of distinct prime factors. So mu of n, is equal to zero if there exists some p such that p square divides n. Now in the other case, if p <coughs> is a product, uh, if n, yeah, if n is a product p1, p2, pr, of course all pairwise distinct, pairwise distinct, Then what you get is, if you have only one, it's minus one, but if you have two minus and minus is plus and so on. And so this is just minus one to the R. Okay. And so what you have for us, let us say, when it converges, you can check that, that for S, real part of S larger than one, you really have something which is to tell you the summation of mu of n over n to the S over n is just zeta of s inverse. This is a uh, something real, and, and you can check that uh, again. So, so all that, all this formalism is not misleading, but you don't have to uh, to, to know whether things converge or not. So this is this Möbius function. It's very interesting. So it is the inverse of one.
So you have really the product one times one minus one is delta. And you know how, del how one minus is made. This associated to Möbius. So again, we are not always strict. I wanted to be strict here, but we are not going to be strict all the time. And the formal power series associated to one minus one, we call it mu also, because it is associated to the sequence mu. Okay. Ah, there is some interest in that. So the first Möbius inversion formula is the basic one. There are zillions of, uh, of Möbius inversion formula, but uh, this may be the most basic. Let f and g be two arithmetical functions. You know that it means nothing. I mean, there are sequences of complex number. The following two relations are equivalent. Following relations are equivalent. One for every n, g of n is equal to sum when d divides n of phi, uh, phi of d. And the second is that for all n, f of n, if the summation when d divides n of g of d mu of n over d. Well, this is a nice one. And uh, this is a Of course you can you can make the proof by uh, forgetting everything about uh, Dirichlet formal Dirichlet series and say I have the definition of mu and then I just have to check each time that it works and uh, and finally you you show that it works but I would like to to give a proof a formal proof proof in Form of power series. So, what is the meaning of one? One is equivalent to the formal power series associated to G if the, if the product of the times D of. Uh, I didn't give a name to this. One, 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 okay. S. Or one, if you prefer. This is one. This is exactly what uh, what it means. Because if you have the function one everywhere, you see here we, we wrote nothing, but this can be one at any point you wish. And in particular, it can be one at the point n over d. Okay? And so this is just what it gives you here. And here you have also a product, the Dirichlet product. And what you are saying here is that d of f and s is equal to d of g of s times 1 minus 1. OK? Well, and of course, you just have. You put the one in that side, you get a minus one, and you get exactly what you wish. You multiply both sides by one minus, and, uh, and you have what you wish. OK? So there's nothing really surprising. Everything is done for that. Okay, so this is an I thing. Ah, OK, there is also something which is a bit clumsy is 
the um, uh, inverse. When, so we have a ring for the product and the sum is fine. We have also a neutral element for multiplication. And so we have seen that there are some Dirichlet functions which are invertible. When is the Dirichlet formal invertible or with the sequence associated to uh, Dirichlet function, Dirichlet series invertible? So, okay. An arithmetical function f, how can I say that, give, produces maybe uh, it's not good to write like that, the Dirichlet series associated to an arithmetical function is invertible if and only if f of 1 is different from 0. This, in any case, is clear because you, may, you, may, you have, must have that the coefficient 1 should be the inverse of the, of the other one. And then d of fs inverse is associated to the function g defined by if you if you have to to, to write it uh, it's not it's not completely trivial g minus 1 g of 1 is uh, f of 1 inverse you see this has to be really the first point in some way when you when, when you just consider the, the, the first point this is, this is quite easy to see and then by induction you have the following that for all n larger than 1 then g of n is minus g of 1 times the sum when d is strictly less than n, and when d divides n, of f of n over d, uh, g of d. This is well defined by induction. You see, when I define, I define it for one. Then each time I have, to, I want to define it for an integer. I just, I am just using the values of g which are less than n. So this makes sense, OK? OK, so what happens for any n? So if you say that it has to be the inverse, it means that what I would expect is that when you make the product of the first Dirichlet series associated to f and the Dirichlet series associated to g, you want to get delta n. Okay. So let us do it. What is sum of d divides n of f of n over d, g of d? What I want to show is that this is delta of n. Okay, what we expect is that this should be delta of n. If n is equal to 1, we made this exactly, this is f of 1, g of 1, and this is delta of 1, which is 1. So we're happy with that. Okay, so now let us assume that n, this is what we want to do, n is larger than 2. Okay, aha, then we have something which is... Uh, not exactly what was written there. There we had the summation when d is up to n. But if you want to have the summation up to n, you take what you had before and you add the value for d is equal to n. Okay? So this is the sum when d divides n and d is less than n 
of f of n over d, g of d, plus what, what occurs when d is equal to n. When d is equal to n, this is f of 1, and this is g of n. Okay? Now this, by construction, we know what it is. By construction, this is g of n, f of 1. And there is maybe a minus even. You divide by g of 1. g of 1 is invertible, yeah, no problem. You divide by g of 1, you get f of 1, and you change the sign. So this should be indeed a plus but minus. Ah, no, 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 this is, this is plus, but here is a minus, okay? And this is fine because what you are getting here is zero. And so it is, well, it is delta of n when n is larger than 2, okay? So it's done, you are happy. Yes, then we go to multiplicative function. It's fine, we can, we can stop here, yeah, okay. So how long? Okay, so we go on with this. <clears throat> uh, Dirichlet expansions, and uh, we are considering multiplicative function. You see what was very nice with the <coughs> zeta function in Euler was saying we have this summation of 1 over 2 to the s is the product when 1 plus 1 over ps plus blah 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 and so on. This function like that. <coughs> so we would be interested and we, we know that this is fine because on the one hand you may have some nice function and on the other hand you just have prime which are the rule of the different primes are separated. This is, this is very important. So in some way, what we would expect is to have something like that for uh, some functions, that this would be the product of one plus f of p to the s, of the f of p to the p to the s plus blah, 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 plus f of p2 divided by p to s plus blah, blah, blah. This, this would be nice to have something like that. If we have something like that, then we say that f is multiplicative. Now, if you want to see it just on the function itself and not spending too much time talking about uh, product, except if we know that it converges or something like that, when we're really in real analysis or complex analysis, if s is complex, but uh, where everything is convergent, we can say directly what should be the good property for f so that you have this exp expansion. So, okay, this would mean that if you have f of p1, a, p1 alpha 1, blah, 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 pr alpha r. So, this is a term we are going to find here with the denominator p1 alpha 1, pr alpha r to the s. Then it means that we are going to find it from the different places. And so, this is what is important. And this is the product P1 alpha 1, blah, 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 F of PR alpha R. Okay? And then this relation, or oh, let's call it M. So definition, an arithmetical function satisfying M. The Dirichlet function, which is associated with the product. So another way to write that is another way to, to write this is to say the following. Uh, this is equivalent to saying okay. You see, from here 
we, are, we must have f of 1 is equal to 1. If we want to have a, a nice product like that, if we have different values, then it has to be 0. It's not something very nice. So of saying that f of 1 is equal to 1, and for any n and m, which are co-prime, then f of n m is the product f of n s of f of m. You see, if you don't certify this condition, you forget about this condition, then f1 is f1 square, which is either 1 or 0. And if, if 1 is 0, then f will be 0 everywhere. We really are not much interested in this function. This is just the, this restriction. What is important is this. Okay. So th those are two ways to say that uh, f is multiplicative. You have this, or simply you say that if two elements are co-prime, then the product of two prime conditions. Okay. So I'm not going to say uh, much more, but uh, then for that, you can see that, uh, of course, since we have f of 1 is equal to 1, then uh, they are all invertible. And uh, moreover, you can see that uh, this condition, if they are invertible, then this condition will still be valid or the Euler product will also be valid because to invert it, you, will, you are going to invert product by product. And so you have a group, the multiplicative function form uh, multiplic and um, uh, commutative group. And the neutral element is still delta as usual. Okay. Uh, you have to check that if you take the product of two functions satisfying this condition, that they're satisfying it also. And so you are happy. So if f, in particular, if f is multiplicative, So R F with one and F with what we define as mu, which is one minus one. Now we take the habit of calling it mu. And just considering functions and the, the law on the functions. Okay. So I take just one example. Uh, Euler torsion function so which is the following for n larger than 1 we let phi of n to be the cardinality of z over n z star the multiplicative group of the invertible residues. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So the, it is also the number of elements between 0 and n minus 1, which are invertible, modulo n, if you want to, to say it like that. Okay. So how can we describe this? So what you do is the following. So what we want to do is just to, to express it. So we do the following, look at all the, look at the set A over N, invertible of not, I don't care, with uh, zero less than A, less than N. So you have N of them. Okay, now what you can do, each one, you have always A over N is equal to the uh, GCD, how can you write that? A divided by the GCD of A and N divided by N divided by the GCD of A and N. Okay? So what you get that way, 
is that, of course, this one is an invertible fr fraction. And so instead of classifying then together, you can classify A over N by the, this denominator, OK? Of course, those two elements are co-prime. This is the, the use of having put everything that they have in common. You put that aside. So they are co-prime. And so what you write like that is the following, that the N, we can, so OK, the N fractions, A over N, can be uh, reorganized in some way as the set of alpha over d, where d divides n and alpha is between a 0 and d and GCD of alpha and D is equal to 1. Okay. Uh, don't forget the 0 because when D is equal to 1, uh, the 0 is important. They are co-prime. 0 and 1 are co-prime. Of course, then for the, uh, the other one, it uh, doesn't match. It doesn't worry. But don't forget this 0 when D is equal to 1. It's fine. So what you are writing is the following with the definition of what is the phi function, what you get is the following that dn so we get the following n will be, now you count, this was counting this number of elements. Now you count it with respect to this element. The denominator, when you put them in an irreducible form, is a div divisor of n. So you have the sum of all the divisor of n. And for a given divisor of n, how many terms do you have? The number of terms you have is by definition phi of, the, phi of d, phi of d. Is it correct? Yes. Ah, this is nice because now you use the Möbius inversion formula. Okay? And so by Möbius, In some way, phi, you, you can you define it uh, this way. You don't see. Well, by the way, you can say that is multiplicative directly if you know something about the Chinese remainder theorem. You can say that it is multiplicative because of that. This is just if you know nothing. At least we have worked a bit on Möbius. Then it, may, it tells you that you have phi of n is the sum when d divides n of uh, n, so n over d, mu of n, mu of d. I mean, of course, you can write it if you prefer to write it is d times mu of n over d, it is the same thing. Write it, write it the, way, the way you like, this is fine. Okay? So, in some way, what, what you say is that the, 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 the phi function is, so here you'd say that the one function is uh, no the identity function uh, if you write identity of n is equal to n you are writing identity uh, is equal this is saying that identity is uh, five phi times one and here what we are writing is that phi is identity is identity times mu Okay, this, this is the only thing we are writing to invert this, uh, this relation. So since 
identity is multiplicative. M times N is equal to MN. So you, need to, you don't even have to, to say that they are co-prime. This is really a, okay, completely multiplicative. <coughs> so phi is multiplicative. So this is a good point. As I tell you, if you want to use by a Chinese remainder theorem, you know that it is also multiplicative. And uh, then if you want to say what is phi of p to the alpha, because this is the only thing you have to know when you know that it is multiplicative, what is phi of p to the alpha? Here, if you put p to the alpha, essentially what you will have to do is to consider the term, this is a p to the alpha, alpha at least one. Then you have one term where, where you have mu of one, one term when you have mu of p, and that's it, nothing else. <coughs> and here, if you have a one, then you get p to the alpha. And if mu of d is equal to p, this will be a minus because mu of p is minus one. And uh, you have p to the alpha divided by p, and this is p to the alpha minus one. Okay, and this is the formula. And of course, if you multiply, uh, you, you know how to find any value. It's not, it's not very nice. It's much better to say it is multiplicative. I know what it is over p to the alpha, and I'm happy with that. You have nothing really nice, nicer than that. Okay. So this type of function is interesting because you have really for any m, you can forget about the coprimality here. You have f of n m is equal to f of n f of m, like n to something, the function to n, you associate n to something, then not, not depending on n, of course, then uh, it is completely, what we call completely multiplicative. There's also something interesting that if you look at the function phi of p, for example, of n over n, as the property that phi of p to the alpha divided to p to the alpha. Well, this is p to the alpha divided by alpha. What I'm saying? Yeah, it's fine. This is 1 minus 1 over p. It doesn't depend on alpha. This is also quite, quite nice in some cases to a function like that. This is called, is, I, don't, I don't write the, the formal definition, strongly multiplicated. So you have two kinds of interesting function. Strongly multiplicative means that phi of p, the f of p to the alpha does not depend on alpha. It depends on p, but it doesn't depend on alpha. And completely multiplicative means that f of n, f of m is equal to f of n times f of m, whatever n m, whether they are co-prime or not. Okay. So then, now I am going to wave a bit hands, at least to recall a few things about prime numbers. So it's on the distribution of prime number. This is just results to know. Okay, so we know that for S larger than one. I recall what we have been saying, that zeta of s is the product of a prime of one minus one over p to the s to the minus one. And 
since S is real number, all that is real and convergent and nice and everything is larger than one. And so you can take the logarithm and take that this is exponential of the sum of the P of minus log of one minus one over P to the S. Okay. So what we said already that the series which is here diverges and uh, but now you know exactly what how it converges you know that it diverges you know that minus log of 1 minus 1 over p to the s we already said that or is or even 1 over p let us say for one term it's fine it is 1 over p plus big o of 1 over p2 you just expand this Logarithm, so it is really the same thing. We already mentioned that, and uh, what we know is that sum of uh, p to the uh, less than x of one over p. I mentioned that this you can get from the fact that the logarithm up to n up to x, the sum of the one over n. Sorry, the sum of one over to n for n up to x is something which is log x even log x plus a constant, which is called gamma, plus uh, big O of 1 over x, and so on. So this is rather well known. And from that, if you work a bit by taking in some way and making some um, uh, two, two sides inequalities of one quantity with the other, you, you get easily that this is equivalent to log log p. Okay. So this is not difficult to get, and uh, you can get, sorry, x. x, yes, yes, thank you. Okay. So now uh, you have also something if you go to the product, maybe I'll don't do that in the, uh, okay, no, let us, let us stop here because this is more or less in the historical side. So this is something that could be understood, uh, let us say, at the time of Euler, to, to have something like that. Now, what we are interested in is to know what is summation of a p less than x of 1. That is to say, the counting function of the primes. Uh, by the way, it's interesting. You can say, aha, what about partial summation? You'll see the difficulty that partial summation is fine if you multiply by a function which is rather smooth or rather small. But if the function here, you have something which is really, you want to get rid of something which is very small, then you will see that you have two terms which have the same size in, your, uh, in, the, in the partial summation. So you get nothing by partial summation. Partial summation is fine if you have something which is, you, you, you have something for one and you want to get something for one over log x or for log x, this is fine. It will work rather well. But uh, if you have uh, something like that, it's much easier to sum one over p than that. It is a question, for example, of the logarithmic density. When you count the element of a sequence up to x, you, you may have the counting function. And if this counting function is equivalent to x something, you say, my set has a density. Okay? But uh, in some cases, it has no density. Take, for example, the numbers which start with a, a 1 in base 10. We have very long blocks with a 1, and then very long blocks even longer without a 1, and then very long blocks with a 1, and so on. So for the density, it's very bad. But if you wait, all your element only by 1 over n, that is to say, if you sum, sum 1 over n, and you sum over the element n up to x, which starts with a 1, then this will have a limit. So in some way, it makes the things smoother. So to know that you have this does not at all imply that you have something like that. Okay? So of course, if you think, now, I would like to have here something which is a rather nice function. What is a nice function for which I will get something which is something like log log x? Then if you take the sum 
when n is less than x of 1 over n log n, then this is easy to, to get, you see, because uh, 1 over n is the derivative of, uh, of log n. So it is just d of log n divided by log n. And when you integrate, you get log log. So this is equivalent to log log x. So you may think, if the prime number are well distributed, then you would expect that pn is equal to n log n. If you don't, don't like this, put n log n. This will be also true. Because you are just not moving this by many elements, and this is very small. This is also true. It's not difficult to see. So in some way, if the prime number are well distributed, then you should have pn is equal to n log n. And pn is equal to n log n. pn is equivalent to n log n. This is equivalent. This is easy to do, but of course, this is not the business. Is equivalent to x over log x. So indeed, after something like that, people started to think, and this was at the end you see, Euler was in the 18th century. This was at the end of the 18th century, at, at the turn between the 18th century and 19th century. Then people like Gauss or Legendre was really expecting something like that. And with the computation they had, it seems to work rather well with the computation they had. Even to have something like x over log x minus a little thing, not exactly one, but uh, if, you, if you know more, now you know that. It should be one would be even better than x over log x, okay? Because for the Lie function, you get an extra term. So what is this number? So you would expect something like that. So at the at the turn of the of the uh, 19th century, people were already thinking that this would be the right order of magnitude. And essentially, what confort it is two things. On the computational side, there was some table. When you know table, uh, you, you had no computer at the time. So table were going to, I don't know, uh, maybe 100,000, uh, surely not, not more than that. 100,000 you can do by hand. But, uh, <coughs> and definitely you see something which is very close to, to x over log x. Uh, and also for theoretical reason. This is a very strong theoretical reason for pi of x is equal to x over log x. <coughs> so then uh, came uh, Chebyshev. And uh, Chebyshev I don't know his name in, the, in Latin characters as he was writing it himself. It was something wonderful with T, C, H, and uh, fi ending with two F at the end. And, uh, okay. Because this, this is really a V in, uh, in Cyrillic language, but it is pronounced F. Uh, okay, so what, uh, what Chebyshev was showed that indeed this is the right order of magnitude. The, what, what he showed is that there exist alpha positive and beta such that uh, pi of x is less than, less than or equivalent, I mean, if x is tending to infinity, of beta x over log x and uh, alpha x over log x. If you don't like this the symbol, you multiply by log x over x, and you take the lim sup and the lim inf. And then it's more correct. OK. So this is the good order of magnitude. And now it means in some way that what you have is that if the lim sup is equal to the lim inf, if alpha is equal to beta, it has to be equal to 1. If it is not one, this doesn't work. Okay? So the problem was really to know that the limit inf and the lim sup exist. If you know that both exist, then you are happy. Okay. And so he introduced also a few functions. I want to, to tell you why and go back, come back to that. So you remember, we are always working with the same thing, uh, which is this is the product of a prime of 1 minus 1 over pi to the s to the minus 1. So if you want to separate the prime factors, then to separate the prime factors, a good way is to take the logarithm of this. So you see immediately the, the, what could be the problem. 
So now we were doing that only when s is larger than 1. But you have also to understand that now we are moving toward the middle of the, 19, of the 19th century. And uh, before, at the beginning of the 19th century, you had people like Cauchy who worked on the complex analysis. So then it made sense to say, aha, we can consider this function for, this is what um, um, Riemann was, uh, was doing. So Riemann was looking at that, was looking at S, a complex number. And then what he was able to prove is that this function as nice property, first of all, this is well defined. If real part of S is equal to, if real part of S is larger than one, then this is this is a real equality, okay? With limit, as you as you know, and everything is fine. But then now, this is a function which is defined on a half plane. And on this half plane, since you have everything which is nicely uniformly convergent and everything like that, this function is. Um, at least uh, analytic, uh, analytic on this part, on the half plane, real part of S larger than 1. So then, since it is analytic, you want to say, Haha, how can we prolongate it? Of course, there will be a difficulty at S is equal to 1. Fortunately, otherwise, uh, we wouldn't speak about prime numbers. So there is, a, there is really a difficulty there. But it, what Riemann proved is that there is indeed uh, a difficulty, which is, but it is a nice difficulty because it is meromorphic. That is to say that if you multiply by s minus 1, it has a limit. And if you multiply by s minus 1, then you have a function which is entire. So you have prolongation. This is what is nice with, uh, with complex analysis, that you have prolongation. So you have prolongation, and then it showed also that you have um, functional equation. If you know what is for s, you know what is for 1 minus s. Okay? So, uh, so you can look at that. And now if you want to say something about uh, prime numbers, then the problem would be, of course, you are going to take the log whatever the way you, you like to take the log, you can take the log. If you prefer to take the derivative of the log, it's a bit nicer because the derivative of the log will be something that minus or zeta prime over zeta. I put a minus because it will be better later on, but this is the same thing. Uh, and, uh, and then you may have difficulty. When is this function? So this function nowadays has nothing to do with this product. This product is very fine. Indeed, when this function has no interest, when real part of s is larger than 1, what is now interesting, and this product does not exist any longer, but it will keep the, the, the flavor that it is a product of the, of the prime number. So what you need to know is when is this different from 0. And in the only, I think it is eight pages or something like that, paper of Riemann, on the zeta function and uh, introducing all that, he, he said, oh, it should be true. He made some computation and showed that the first zero were on the real line or the, on the critical line, that real part of s is equal to one half. By the way, it is interesting. How can you prove that you have a, a zero which has real part exactly equal to one half by, by computation? This is interesting. I don't know if you have thought of that. How can we prove by computation that we have zeros and now we know billions of zeros and all of them are real part equal to one half? How can we prove that? I don't say uh, I make computation with uh, 30 decimals and all are, uh, it is uh, 0 0.5000. No, 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 no. I want to say that it is one half. Well, for the following reason that if you have a zero, what he, what he did for the first zeros, he has a, so he was looking here, and he was looking that s is equal to the real part of s, which is called usually sigma is equal to one half. But then you have a nice formula to say how many zeros do you have in a given region. This is something. You have an integral which tells you that, and this integral has to have an integer value. And if you say it is between one half and and three half, 
then you know that it has to be exactly equal to 1. And by computation, you can say, well, it is between 1 half or 3 half. So you have only one zero here. You have only one zero. Yes, but you have the functional equation. If you have a zero here, functional equation will tell you you have a zero here. Yes, but this is not a problem because the coefficients are all real. So since, the, since you have a zero here, you have a zero here. So in some way, the symmetry of the zero is not only with respect to this point, but also with respect to this line because of the uh, conjugacy. Fine. Now, if you have one zero here, if you have, those zeros are symmetrical. If you know that there is one zero, there is no point. It has to be on the half line. And then you prove by actual computation that this is true. And if it turns out that in real life, there is a zero, which is a multiple zero, double zero, you can, you can say that it's, its real part is equal to one half. Because in any case, whatever you do, you will find that there are two points. So in theory, yes, but in practice, ah, you have made some computation, there are two. OK, too bad. You cannot say what is going on. So this is very important. And indeed, in the Riemann conjecture, not only we think that all the, what we say, non-trivial zeros are on this symmetry line, but also that they are simple. Okay. So OK, so then uh, it tells that uh, if, if the zeros are here, then by uh, integration, you compute the number of zero you have, and then, and then you, you, you can get some information about the prime numbers, and, and you are done. And you have a good error term, not for pi of x function. I will go back to the other Trebuchet function, but you have a nicer function than this one. And it will tell you that you have a very good error term. But even if you are not interested in a good error term, it is enough to say, for example, that if you look at just s is real part of s is equal to 1. If you have no 0 here, then you are happy. And the fact that it is non 0 here doesn't mean much when you, when you go back to this, to this value. So this was the, the, the proof of uh, Adam Arendt de la Vallée Poussin. It was the same year. But it was, you see, it took some time. It was at the end of the 19th century that uh, Adam Arendt he was a professor at Bordeaux at that time. I have to I must, uh, insist on that. And de la Vallée Poussin is a Belgian mathematician. And independently, they proved that there is no zero here. And so they proved that, OK, pi of x is equivalent to x over log x. Okay. De la Vallée Poussin proved indeed a bit more than that. Because he, he considered a better zero free region. And so he had a better real term. So de la Vallée Poussin is better than, uh, than Adama on the prime number theorem. OK, so uh, let us go back to, to this. OK, we are interested in this. What is, the, what is the expansion of this? Well, expansion of this is not too complicated. It will be the sum. You, you just uh, to have, you see, the, the, you, to differentiate this product, it's not too difficult. The log of the product, because it is the sum. So you're differentiating the sum. You just have to think that what is the differentiate of that? This you write as be, being exponential of uh, s log n. And so if you differentiate this, you will get something which is a log n, n to the, or n to the, if you have n to the minus s, there would be a minus, and then there would be a minus, and then would be n to the, to the minus s. OK? So this is why, forget about the minus, which is here. Then this will give you a minus log. And since you don't like the, the log, you put it like that. And this will be log p the sum over p of alpha of p to s alpha. I mean, to write this, this is OK. Uh, as soon as you are real part of s is larger than 1, this is really a usual analysis. There is nothing, uh, nothing more than that. OK, so you see that, indeed, a nice a natural function for counting prime is not exactly counting prime with coefficient 1, like in the pi function. It's much better to count prime powers with a weight which is log p. But you know that a weight log p, this is not bad, because you can destruct by partial summation something which is a log p. This is fine. You can add it or suppress it. This is OK.
Oh. Yeah, there, there's something else I want to tell you, so I will stop with that and, and go really to <coughs> prime in arithmetic progression. Okay, so uh, this is called the summation of lambda n over n to the s. And this function lambda, which is log p if n is a prime power and uh, zero otherwise, then this is called van Mangel function. Sorry? This? Yes, uh, this is the same. This is the same thing as, for example, in in France, when you have noble names or something like that, the particle is put in a uh, in small von Mangold. This is this is O, by the way. The same way when we are going to talk about van der Korput, we write van der Korput like that. Yes, when you said de la Vallée Poussin, de la Vallée Poussin, you will write de la Vallée Poussin. Yes. Okay. This is why Desouillet, you start with a capital G. <laughs> Uh, so lambda n is equal to log p if p if n is equal to some power of p and zero otherwise. So you see that to go back to the uh, characteristic function, indicator function of prime, this is about the same thing. So and you have the Chebyshev introduce the function psi of x, which is the sum n up to x of lambda n. And you have also the theta of x closer to the prime number. Forget about prime powers. And you just write p is up to x of log p. And then this is just a very easy exercise to show that to show that you have theta of x, psi of x, psi of x is equivalent to theta of x, is equivalent to pi of x log x. Here you forget about something about prime powers. Squares are not peanuts compared with, uh, with prime numbers. This is nothing. And, uh, and it's just partial summation. OK. And indeed, this function is the, the most natural function because it is connected to that. And if you want to have a good error term in the prime number, better to work on psi function. So you can really see the van Mangel function, think that it is the indicator function of the primes. But it is the good indicator function of the primes. So uh, I think I stop here for that. Is it ah, yes, no, no, there is something which is important, um, which is Merton's theorem. Of course, before 1896, uh, people have been working. I was mentioning different per persons. And uh, Merton's proved the, the following. And this is something which is useful. Uh, quite usefully, we are back to, to, to our famous product, product of p up to x, of 1 minus 1 over p. Uh, this is equivalent. And to a certain constant, and he, he computed what is this constant. This constant is e to the minus gamma over uh, log x. So not only that, but also people have been uh, approximation. So this is 1 plus little o of 1, and you have explicit form for the little o of 1 
if you need to make precise computation, but it's good to know that it is equivalent to a constant. You don't care much usually about the, the value e to the minus gamma, but it is equivalent to a constant over log x. But you see, this is of this, you are still on that side when you are here. So it was really before the prime number theorem. Okay. Okay, so I want to say something about prime. Um, Maybe I have no time for the order of the function, but this is not very important. But I would like to, to cheat again and say something about primes in arithmetic progression. OK, for a few arithmetic progression, you can prove by bare hands that there are infinitely many primes. For example, uh, if you look at the number you take all the primes you know, and you consider this number, this number you can write it as a product of primes. But uh, since the product of the primes are congruent to minus 1 or to 3 mod 4, then it cannot consist only on prime numbers which are congruent to 1 mod 4. So this means that there exist infinitely many primes which are congruent to one mod, to three mod four. This is the easy one. So, as I said, this implies that uh, consideration of this number implies exist infinitely many primes congruent to three mod four. Congruent to one mod four is more complicated. Because you see, if you start with a number which is congruent to, to 3 mod 4, there's no reason why he, he should have a prime factor which is congruent to 1, to, to, to one mod 4 inside. If you can prove that this number is not a prime number and has an odd number of primes or something like that, uh, then you may be... Uh, but, okay. Now, what you do with the following, you take all the prime you know, and you square it, and you add one. Then it is, if you take it just with a plus one, not squaring it, this doesn't vanish because if you have an even number of primes which are congruent to three mod one, mod four, then uh, then it can be this number can be can be like that. Now if you put a square in it, then you are back to Fermat and to Gauss also, and uh, if you work a bit on that, but basically, let us say the, the easiest is Fermat, but of course Ga Gauss will help you, but uh, uh, what, you what you can show, but it's not trivial, you see, just like that, you, you, you can't tell it, uh, that it's not difficult, but uh, that this number has no prime factor congruent to 3 mod 4. So this, in this number, you see it is the sum of two square, and even one of the square is equal to one. So this number has no prime factor congruent to 3 mod 4. And so, yes, but uh, no, 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 but this one has known. This is the point. Because otherwise, it can, uh, uh, ah, yeah, you can prove, yeah, you can say, okay, you, you can, if you want to make it easier, you're right. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, one, one easy thing to say is that, uh, no, it's not even obvious. Yes, either it is a square uh, or it has, it has a square part. If it has prime factors congruent to 3 mod 4, they will be in the square part. But this, if it, if it, if it has only a square part, yeah, if it has only, th this cannot have only a square part. Yeah, I agree, this is easier than what I was thinking of, yeah. But you have to know in any case that, uh, that this number as um, the prime has to be squares. This is the this is the point. Yeah, and this is why Fermat is Fermat is enough to to show that. Okay, so again, this will imply congruent to one mod four. Okay. So now, what I suggest is that we are doing some. No, first I give you the the the, the main theorem I was mentioning, theorem of Dirichlet. You will see why it is connected with the, 
with Dirichlet expansion. Sorry? Yes, yes, since it is a square plus one, it cannot be, it, it has no square part. No, it is not a square. Oh, yes. Why? It can be divisible by a square, of course. Of course, yeah. No, no, no this, is, this, this may work. It cannot be a square. This is the point. Since all the prime factor congruent to 3 mod 4 have to be in the square part, all the ones which are not in the square part have to be uh, congruent to 1 mod 4. But this is, not, uh, this is not completely trivial neither. So, theorem of Dirichlet. Uh, I, I give you the dates because there are two dates. I will comment on that later on. That the following let A between 0 and Q and GCD of AQ is equal to 1. One has, right GCD, I know, then one has summation P up to X and P congruent to A mod Q, mod Q of 1 over P is equivalent to 1 minus phi of q log log x. So it says that in the logarithmic sense, the primes which are in a given arithmetic progression are well distributed, at least when they can be primes. Because if a and q are not co-prime, well, there can be at most one prime which is congruent to a mod q. Okay, so now what I would like to do is to make some fiction about that and to say, uh, let us be naive and try to see how we could try to prove something like that with bare hands. At least for Q, let us be modest. Try to prove something of the kind and maybe not, it will not be equivalent, but uh, something of the kind. At least I want to say that the, the sum of the prime up to x which are congruent to 1 mod 4, this series is something like log log x. And for the prime which are congruent to 3 mod 4, this sum is also some constant time log log x. Okay? And so there will be infinitely many. Usually it is quoted by saying there are infinitely many, but it is proving more than that. Okay, so we say, well, let us be good students of Euler. So we are making the following, we are considering the product when P is congruent to 1 uh, mod 4, or 1 minus 1 over P to the S to the minus 1. Okay, I consider this and try to see what I can do with that. So this will be, I will call that P1 of X. Okay, then you can expand it. This is 1 plus 1 over PS plus 1 over P to the 2S plus blah, 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 if you want. And this will be the product of the prime. Okay, for real part of S larger than 1, this is absolutely great. There is no problem about that. Okay. But then now, the point is... If you are going to expand that, of course it is the sigma of some A of n over n to the s. But what can you say about this series? About nothing. It is the sum of the elements which have all the prime factor are congruent to 1 mod 4. Yeah, but maybe there are not that many. Of course, uh, Euclid tells us that you, you have infinitely many, but they can, it can be very seldom. So you, you cannot say much about that. We, you, have no, you have no information. You see, for Euler, what was very nice is that this sequence was a very nice sequence. It was all the primes. Okay. So this you cannot say much. 
Well, now you say, okay, let us be symmetric and let us consider P3 of S. I think you, you see what is P3 of S, okay? And then, of course, for this one, you expand it and you don't know much better what is going on. Ah, now you have at least one information, which is nice, is that you know what is the product P1 of S, P3 of S. This you have a nice expansion. It is almost the sum of all the 1 over S, except that you have to say that N is congruent to 1 mod 2. But this is very nice. And you can say everything you wish for that. You can say what is the limit, uh, find an equivalent when S is tending to infinity. It's more or less one half of the previous one. So this is, this is very good. So this is nice. OK. Now, uh, it's fine, but here you have just the, the product. So you try to be smart. I don't know how. It is some... Um, uh, historical fiction I am I'm trying to do uh, to see you see when you write a paper you don't write how you, you you got the idea of something so what I try to see is how Dirichlet might have thought of because in his work he was inventing a lot of things so usually it's not maybe because he first invented the characters and then he proved that but let us say okay I have the product now I want to have the quotient but if I can say something about this, that this is something which is rather nice. If this is more or less a constant, then you are happy. Essentially, you are done. If this is a constant, then those two are more or less the, si the same order of magnitude. And see, the product is something like, a, um, so you are, uh, before taking the, the log, since the product is the same as that, then each one will be the square root. And this means that if you are going to take the log, you will get one half, coefficient one half here. Okay. So this is not too bad. If, you, if this is a constant, it's, uh, it's okay. So now you write it, what it is. Well, this you know how to do it because this is the product of a prime congruent to one. Well, congruent to 1 mod 4, I think you, you understand the, the business. 1 minus 1 of p to the minus 1, and then you have the product when p is congruent to 3 of 1 minus 1 of p to the s. No minus 1 because you are dividing by this. Aha. Uh -huh. This is better, and you write that as the summation of xi of n over n to the s. Of course, n has to be odd, but you don't care much. n congruent to 1 or 2. What is this function? You know, you know what you can say, that psi of n psi of n is equal to uh, zero. Let us say n odd. I don't uh, um, for even even element. I will never get them. So I just get odd element, which are for prime numbers on the odd prime numbers, of course, is zero if there exists a prime p congruent to 3 mod 4 such that p square divides n. Because when you make the product here, for 3, you just have powers to powers 1. You don't have squares here. Here you have squares because you expand this as usual. But in this one, you stop at 1. You just in some way, with respect to prime congruent to 3, they are square free. Like in the mu function, you have something which is product of all the prime of 1 minus 1 over p to the s, and you just get square free numbers. So you have this, and then you are quite happy, because otherwise, then it's fine. It is 1 if n is congruent to 1, what, 4? Is it true what I'm saying? Uh, 
Yeah, minus 1 if n is congruent to 3 mod 4. Because then you have to say, so this one will be just something which is positive, which is a 1. And this one will give you, like in the Möbius function, it depends on the number of primes congruent to 3 mod, uh, mod 4. If you have an even number of them, then you get a 1. If you have an odd number, you get a minus 1. But this is exactly saying that n is congruent to 1 or to 3 mod 4. This is not too bad because it seems to be more or less regular, except, you see, instead of saying you are just counting primes, you are just counting numbers which are congruent to 1 mod 4 or to 3 mod 4. OK. This is not too bad, but this is not really great because you still have this condition, which may perturbate you a bit. So what you want to do is in some way to modify this, thinking this is very good. If we had something like that on all integers, we'd be very happy. Because you see, I mean something which is 1 minus 2 over or minus 3 over plus 5 over minus 7 over. This is something you can do. This is, well, you, you can get it through usual analysis. So what you do now <coughs> is that you are going to force something which are to put the squares in here, okay? And then you want to keep something which will be, which will not perturbate that. So if you want not to perturbate that, you have to say each time I have uh, even power, I put a one because even number, even a square will give us something which is a plus one in this congruence. So you are going to say, I want to instead replace this by something which is 1 minus 1 over ps plus 1 over p2s minus 1 over p3s. If I do that, I am very happy. So let us do it. I, I raised that. I need some room, but not too much. I'm a bit above the time, but uh, I would like to finish that. So, okay, so what I do is the following. I consider this product. When p is congruent to 1, mod 4, a 1 minus 1 over p to the s to the minus 1. And then I take the product when p is congruent to 3, and I say this is 1 minus 1 over p s plus 1 over p 2 s minus 1 over P4S, P3S, plus blah, blah, blah. This is nice. This is the summation of something which is, call it as you wish, chi, you like chi? Let us put it chi. Chi of n over n to the s, n up to, uh, over n. What is chi of n? is equal to zero if n is even. You produce only odd numbers, but this is not too bad. And then it is exactly one if n is congruent to one mod four and minus one if n is congruent to three mod four. This is wonderful. This is one minus one over three to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s, minus 1 over 7 to the s, plus blah, blah, blah. This is very nice function. Not only it converges, but it converges even for s is equal to 1. You see? It's great. So when s tends to 1, this number tends to a constant. So everything is done, except one thing. If this constant is equal to zero, you have a difficulty, okay? So what you have to show that this constant is different from zero. But this is easy in this case to see that what the modification you are doing, it's at worst to subtract one over three. So for S larger than or equal to one, this will be always larger than two thirds. This is not difficult to show. 
Okay? So you are happy. So it is really a positive constant. So it is a positive constant and you are very happy. So those two elements have up to a constant the same order of magnitude. But when you are going to take the log, you don't care. They are essentially equal. They are the square root and you have this result. So now you want to generalize and to understand what you have been doing by doing this type of thing. This is fine for four. Now you may go by bare hands. And what we have been doing is to look at this function. This is a very nice function. It has the merit of being totally multiplicated. And uh, arithmetic function. And it is periodic with period four. So now what you can try to do is try to do the same thing, to have multiplicative functions which are periodic with period Q. Those are called Dirichlet characters. They are invented exactly for that. So now you have to say, OK, so I am going to look at the group Z over QZ star. So the one which are not in the business, which are not co-prime, you get a zero. But you see, this zero is not important because what you get is something which is periodic. It's as good as the, as the Riemann function. So you do that for all the characters you can find mod Q. And you first find some difficulty. There are two difficulties in the business. One the general one is to say that this sum shouldn't vanish at s is equal to 1. And this is an important point. And if you remember, or if you are going later on to look at a proof, complete proof of that, you'll see that one of the difficulty, once you have introduced the Dirichlet characters, this is the, the difficult point. Show that this number is non-zero. If this number is zero, you may be in a difficulty, you see, here. If it is non-zero, everything is done. So this is one of the difficulty. But also, you have to understand what is the character of this group. And of course, with what we know, we know that if q is a prime number, it will be easier because z of a qz star is a cyclic group. Okay, And this is why you have two dates. Because this is the proof when q is a prime number, and this is the general proof. OK? So, OK, I stop here for today. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> questions? Of course, Dirichlet never said how he, he got on, uh, on his business, but uh, I think this is some plausible way. <laughs>